Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar on why would I need a terahertz time domain spectrometer. Today, we are uh, talking, uh, Enrico Dardanus and me, Enrico, product manager, and I myself, I'm responsible for uh, mainly terahertz sales, but also femtosecond laser sales. Thanks also, Sakshi, for introducing us in the beginning. I'd like to open this talk by mentioning a bit about what you can expect from today's webinar. Of course, I will tell you one, two words on who we are and what we are actually doing. One of the most important part will, of course, be to give you an introduction to terahertz spectroscopy. What means actual the terahertz range and how do we generate and detect terahertz waves? After that, I will continue with giving you an outlook on what potential terahertz solutions could look like in specific I give you interesting systems that come all fiber coupled. One demonstration will be related to the Terra smart system that Menlo Systems is coming up. And of course, a very interesting point for all the audience out there will be a few applications that are giving you a bit of introduction and a glimpse on where you can actually use the powerful tool Terahertz time domain spectroscopy. So let's start with a few words on Menlo Systems. We are a company that's dedicated to high precision metrology and specifically using laser instruments. Menno Systems is widely known for its Nobel Prize winning optical frequency comp technology by which we are setting new standards. A very famous person among the funders of Menno Systems is Professor Dr. Theodor Hensch, whose picture you see on the front of, on the, on the upper part of this presentation. Our headware quarters are located in the southwest of Munich. Uh, this part of Munich is called Martinsried in Germany. We do have other locations uh, freshly opened in Japan and China and also the US. Our solutions serve international customers, whether they are from industry or from science. And as being a precision metrology um, company, we are the experts in fiber laser technology. Two of the actual uh, other co-founders of Menno Systems and former PhD and postdoc students among under Professor Theodor Hensch are given here. It's Michael May and Ronald Holzfahrt, who is the CTO, and Michael May, the CEO of Menno Systems. We are the pioneers in optical frequency comms. Our systems establish stability, accuracy, and an unbeaten reliable market. Our also stable lasers deliver subhertz line with at nearly any wavelengths. And our femtosecond fiber lasers, by employing a unique and superior patented figure nine mode locking laser technology, enables lowest noise performance of such systems. The same systems, as you will see in the next slides as well, are one of the core components of a terahertz time domain spectrometer. Now, let's have a look on our evolution over time. And I'm keeping this a bit shorter and concentrating myself on the terahertz history of Menno systems. After being founded as a spin-off of the Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics, our terahertz history dates back almost 15 years until 2007, when we first commercially set up systems that are free space and later on also fiber coupled. Actually, the first fiber coupled terahertz dynamic spectrometer made in Germany. It was 2017 when we came up with a very compact system that you will see later on, and this is also integrated as an OEM engine to terahertz customers. Late 2019, we came up with an ultra-fast system that can be also used to use, uh, to use it for ultra-fast spectroscopy purposes. And 2021 is the year of newer generations, new features, and new add-ons that help you to achieve your goals and your experiments. In the same year, we also moved to a different location, just two kilometer distant from the earlier one. But this uh, production means that we can scale our facilities and deliver more and even higher the precision metrology instruments to you. Let's come back to terahertz and a gap or a terahertz, the terahertz regime that was former named the gap now becomes accessible. Let's have a look at the uh, specific uh, energy band where terahertz is located at. Terahertz is to be named the energy band between the microwave and the infrared and visible light. You can access this terahertz formerly known as a gap from the photonics point of view or from the electronics point of view. This talk will be about coming to the terahertz uh, energy band by photonic means. What means one terahertz? One terahertz is related to one picosecond or the wavelengths of 300 micrometers. But what are actual applications that serve in this uh, energy band? We will come to this point in the next slides. 
let's first concentrate on the very, very important benefits of Darrowhead's dynamic spectroscopy in comparison to other well-known and established techniques. First of all, it's a non-ionizing and non-invasive technique that is also non-harmful compared to, for instance, X-ray. It is also a completely contact-free uh, method. If you compare it to ultrasound, you don't need any complex media to achieve your or to measure your signals. And what's also super important is terahertz penetrates non-polar materials. And such materials are in specific interest for industrial applications like polymers, paper, wood, ceramics, but also chemical powers and paint coating. Think of car industry. Terahertz spectroscopy also identifies numerous molecules through distinctive absorption and dispersive features. What's more is that terahertz is a highly sensitive uh, technique to water content. So even in food monitoring and environmental uh, inspection, this can be an important point, but also in relation to tissue and cell analysis where you know water content is usually very high. And last point is, and this is also an important point, it enables to coverage ultra fast processes. And what's more is that it enables high-speed wireless communication, what's meant to be 6G in the future. Let's concentrate on what you actually need to do terahertz dynamic spectroscopy. So we are talking about generation and detection of terahertz waves. First of all, terahertz sources are widely spread. There are many different means of how to generate terahertz waves. From solid state electronic sources to high power vacuum electronics, terahertz lasers like famously known quantum cascade lasers that are just becoming available on the market, ionization of plasma. But what's important to mention is there are optical generation means to generate terahertz waves. For instance, optical rectification where you use uh, specific crystals, but you have to go by free space uh, laser beams into such optics. And in comparison to optical rectification, we have photoconductor switches like low temperature gallium arsenide or indium gall gallium aluminium arsenide. It becomes obvious and it's needless to say that the photoconductor switches are the most important uh, tools which makes system a uh, commercially available and rigged tool. They are first of all compact. They are more or less cost-effective. They work at room temperature. If you compare it to other techniques that I mentioned before, they provide a great SNR and a comparably high uh, broad bandwidth for spectroscopy means. And of course, they can use very compact fiber lasers, femtosecond fiber lasers for their operation. You can easily guide them into fibers, well-known fibers from telecom technology. This is how terahertz sign spectroscopy looked like back in the days. Just to give you an outlook on how the evolution took place from free space systems to fiber coupled solutions. We will now deal with the technique how MANO systems is generating and detecting terahertz waves. First of all, we need three main components. I would call the first one and most important part is an ultra fast laser system. For MANO system, this can be as compact as this quite modular ELMO laser system, it's a 15, 60 nanometer source, and it comes as all our lasers with our uh, superior figure nine mode locking technology, enabling highest uh, reliability of laser pulses and lowest jitter. Now, this laser comes fiber coupled, as I said, you have two fiber coupled output ports. One is going to the emitter, the second one to the detector. Of course, if you want to do time domain spectroscopy and you want to have a certain time resolution, you have to employ an optically ley line. This is what you see here. It's basically a motorized linear stage that is delaying one arm against the other. At Mental Systems, we developed this by ourselves. It's a super high precision optical, optomechanical delay line delivering a high scan range and higher spectroscopic resolution for your spectroscopy applications. Talking about the emission detection of terahertz waves, optical pulses hit the semiconductor structure in a typically very tiny gap. This is what you see on this right side, the red red beam here is hitting the semiconductor structure. It creates electron and hole pairs. And by applying a certain bias voltage onto the chip, you create uh, these electrons are accelerated through the holes. And that's, well, this is what it needs to take to emit terahertz waves. You can deal with different terahertz optics outside, can be polymer lenses or coated mirrors to collect and collimate the outgoing terahertz uh, waves. On the detection side, it's a comparably same principle. You have an incoming optical pulse. Now, in this case, you don't need to apply any bias voltage simply because the incoming terahertz wave that you see here acts as an accelerator of the electrons to the holes. What you in the end measure is a photocurrent that you can amplify a deconverted 
and simply compute it in your um, acquisition platform, what you see here as an example. Now, I'd like to go a little bit deeper into how such a system can look like. If you look at commercially available system and one that is displayed here is our Terra Smart system. This will be a video. I will comment the video quickly for you. And what you see here on this optical table is on the left an uh, optical terahertz setting. That's the terahertz integration zone. And we have a completely integrated terahertz sign domain spectrometer. You only need to plug it to your power supply and you are re ready to measure. Let's have a little closer look on the front panel of such a system. This system houses already such a laser system that I've shown you before. It houses the PC, the delay line, and the control electronics. Everything you need to do to have time domain spectroscopy settings. You have several output ports available. By default, it's two. It can be four uh, output ports, which enable you to drive several experiments at the same time. So make this system really a multi-channel system measuring transmission and reflection at the same time. There's a turnkey switch of the laser system, the uh, emitter supply, you have the uh, amplify, amplification of the signal, the signal input that is measured from the antenna, and you have the control LEDs for the laser switch, the bias. You have USB ports, one on the front and three on the back side of the system itself. Okay, this is part of the system. Now let's have a little closer look on the optics. What is displaced here is an enclosure that enables you to purge your system to extract any water absorption line, which is highly uh, absorbing terahertz wave from your experiment to enhance your spectroscopical means. The optics are fully cage mounted, making it a really uh, rigid and reliable optics. No, no disalignment over time. You have one emitter and one detector on the left and on the right side. In between, you have off-axis parabolic mirrors for focusing and collimation of the beam. Of course, the distance of your terahertz path can be changed and customized according to your needs. Now, I showed you before the system, the optics. Of course, the software is a super important part. You don't want to spend too much time on the software end. So let's have a look on how a manual system software looks like and what it offers you to exploit. First of all, this is our graphical user interface. You have several buttons on the top. You can set different measurement uh, setups like the scan speed, like the scan range. And also you, there's a nice function that is called find pulse. Whenever you are outside of your actual terahertz pulse, it shifts automatically by using a peak finder to your actual terahertz signal. What you see here, this noise is now showing that the laser is enabled, of course, but as I explained to you earlier, you need to apply a certain bias voltage onto your antenna and only from that point on, you will see a terahertz signal. You can see on the left side, a time domain pulse and on the right side, the Fourier domain pulse. This is an online measurement, no averaging of pulses. You can zoom in, zoom out. You can extract important information of your time domain signal. For instance, if you look at multi-layer structures, but of course you can also look at the spectroscopic part of your experiment, look at the very edges of your um, uh, uh, absorption Peaks. Now, of course, you can do this online and uh, do these measurements without any averaging, but of course, you can average over time to extend and improve your signal to noise ratio over your signal. And this is what you see here. The noise level drops significantly. And as you see on this uh, picture here, the bandwidth that you can achieve is more than six terahertz while showing more than 100 dB of signal to noise ratio or what you call dynamic range. Now, this can be seen as really a Swiss knife tool, as terahertz delivers multiple parameters to, uh, very, to a wide variety of applications, as you will see in the next slide. You can look at the amplitude changes, phase differences. You can look at the different absorption of the spectra and the spectroscopic footprint, like you see it here for electos, for instance. And from that measurement, you can extract very important optical parameters like the refractive index and the absorption of your structure and compare to a reference setting. It's a classical spectroscopic means, which means you compare typically a reference signal against a sample that you place in the same terahertz path. Now, I think this is a good point to start, a, uh, a good time to start a poll. There will be two polls coming up to you right now. Uh, I'd like you to answer this poll and I will inform you a bit on what I mean by uh, those two questions. Please read these two polls, answer them carefully yourself. And the first poll will be, did you employ terahertz time domain spectroscopy, short form terahertz TDS before? A, sim a simple answer would be yes or no. And the second question would be, 
which instrument features do you consider as being most important for your application? This is a multiple choice question. You can answer to this by the bandwidth, the dynamic range, the terahertz power, the scan speed, the flexibility, or any other point. If you look on this scheme here, I'd like to refer a bit to what means bandwidth. Bandwidth is scaled in terahertz, and it means looking from the left corner to the right corner where you see this noise level dropping. So in this case, it would be more than six terahertz. I would say 6.5 terahertz reached here. And the dynamic range is said to be the noise level compared to the peak of the signal, which is typically achieved at one terahertz, and is set here to be around 100 or 95 dB. So I'm waiting for your input now. And I hope I can read out the answers in the next couple of sec seconds. So we got the answers and uh, I guess these are shown to you as well. Uh, there's a two third answer for yes. So most of you have used terahertz dynamics at Troscopy. That's nice to hear. I hope there will be more additional information to come for you soon on uh, current performances and new features. And the second question has been answered to being uh, the most important points are the bandwidth followed by the dynamic range, the terahertz power, scan speed, flexibility, and other. Thank you for participation now, and we will continue with our next points in our topic, which is the terahertz time domain solutions offered by Mendel Systems. The solutions vary from a very compact, versatile, to an ultra-fast laser system, a terahertz time domain spectroscopy system. On the first hand, I'd like to introduce you two systems that are related to the delay line that I explained to you before. There's this one very compact system that contains all the requirements that you need to do terahertz sine range spectroscopy in just 19 inch rack. It's the so-called TerraSmart model. This is an all integrated system that is also sold to OEM uh, customers by Mano Systems. Now in comparison to TerraSmart, we have a system that delivers more or less the similar terahertz performance, but offers a much wider application field. This is mainly because we are employing here a different laser system that's called C-Fiber laser system. It can deliver dual uh, wavelengths output, not only 1560 that you typically use for terahertz time domain spectroscopy, but also 780 nanometer. And you will later on see why this can be important for your application. Also, in addition to that, the laser system can be synchronized to external laser systems to enable easily pump probe experiments. And what's more is such a laser system can be upgraded to our Terra ASOP system. Now, you might be wondering what is the difference between Terra Smart, Terra K15, and Terra ASOPs? I can tell you that you can see this on the figure right already. We are employing two laser systems, two laser systems that are locked to each other, but with a slight offset in a repetition rate. This enables you to do ultra fast uh, terahertz measurement. You could imagine of terahertz imaging where you typically do raster scans and where this technique would um, uh, significantly, significantly boost your scan performance. And what's more is that it delivers a higher resolution than compared to delay lines. Now let's have a closer look on the performances of typically delay line based systems like TerraSmart and K15. I mentioned to you, performance can be quite similar. We are using iron dope semiconductor antennas or com fiber coupled. The length of the antennas can be user defined. The bandwidth is defined to be more than six terahertz with a signal to noise ratio, or let's say dynamic range of 100 dB. The scan range uh, is somewhat constrained in TerraSmart. It's 850 picosecond, which means less than 1.2 gigahertz of spectral resolution. That's because this system is so compact. But on the other hand, TerraK15 is our multi-toolbox, which allows you also to integrate 1,600 of picoseconds, which means in a full scan, you can explore 0.6 gigahertz of spectroscopic resolution, which is unbeaten on the market. Now, coming to the scan range, a typical scan range uh, uh, means 100 picoseconds. At 100 picoseconds, Mendel Systems offers an unbeaten uh, scan speed for delay lines uh, of 17 hertz. In relation to delay line based systems, again, looking on this figure on the right means the ASOP systems. ASOP stands for asynchronous optical sampling. We employ one laser and a second laser. One is the pump pulse, the second one is the probing pulse. This is a true optical sampling technique. And this means we can scan much faster and not constrained by any delay line principles anymore. However, if we are looking on the spectroscopic part, one has to say there's a certain downside when you do choose two laser systems because each laser of course can jitter with a slight means, which means in turn, the spectroscopic uh, bandwidth is 
more than 4.5 terahertz and the dynamic range is more than 70 dB of um, uh, peak dynamic range between one terahertz and, and the noise level. But in turn to the delay line based systems, we can explore more than 600 hertz and this is completely range independent. No matter if you scan five picoseconds or 10 picoseconds, completely the same high scan speed. And what's more is Terra ASOPs can also deliver 780 nanometer beam pulses for instance for pump probe experiments. And I can give you a little spoiler on a system that is already on the market. That's our OSE engine. It's a compact ASOP system. And that is now just being tested in first testbed settings with delivering more than four kilohertz of uh, scan speed for achieving a terahertz time trace of, in this case, on the left side, 70 picoseconds. We also showed, uh, we have also showed a 30 kilohertz scan time trace of uh, eight picoseconds scan range. So. This is a really nice achievement. I think this is a good uh, time where you can drop your uh, questions in the Q&A part of the session. And maybe Enrico, you can look into the Q&A files now and we will continue with our next and application slides. So hi everybody. Uh, thank you for the questions. I have uh, seen a couple of them. So um, Sonal Saxina, I hope. I'm uh, pronouncing the name correctly, asks if we can tell again the spectral resolution. Um, it doesn't specify which system, so we just refer myself to uh, the K15. And uh, so basically we have two versions of it. We have two possible uh, uh, de delay ranges. Uh, the standard one, it's 850 picosecond. There we have a resolution of around 1.2 gigahertz. And in the uh, extended uh, uh, type of delay line, double of the range, 1,600 1, picosecond, there we have below 0.7 gigahertz. I hope I'm answering the question. And uh, Timo Rind asks, uh, if it's also possible to directly gain B scans from the devices. So our devices uh, have uh, the possibility to scan uh, single pixel, but we do have also uh, the possibility to make imaging and standard S2 axis. And we do have the hyperspectral software to evaluate uh, these images. And there is a third question uh, regarding the specs. Uh, that's a question from Bernard Thierry. I hope also I'm pronouncing well. Hi, regarding the specs, uh, so we mentioned, so he asks uh, if the specification we mentioned are from the emitter side. So uh, the specification we mentioned in terms of bandwidth, uh, dynamic range uh, are depending on the combination between uh, basically lasers and antennas and both of emitting and detection antenna uh, play a role in this. So it's a combination of the different parts. Okay, so there is a question. Uh, I would say that the question is from Itai Epstein. And if I could comment the a comparison between terrace detection, uh, how we do it, so photoconductive switches, with a cool uh, sil silicium bolometer. So um, I would like uh, to uh, answer this question uh, later on. Would you like, uh, because, uh, because I think the topic uh, can be a little bit long to discuss here. If you want to know more about it, please uh, send us an email and uh, we will be happy to talk. And uh, for everybody asking questions, uh, please uh, ask them in the Q&A box uh, because the chat box uh, will not be visible to us uh, uh, unless we do explicitly there. So please, uh, please ask uh, the questions you have uh, in Q&A. Okay, so uh, there is a last question and then we will move on to applications. And please continue asking questions. We will reply them uh, there later on from Deepak Kumar. So is the optical rectification 
uh, okay, so there is a question between the difference uh, from uh, crystal, uh, from crystal uh, generation of terrace radiation and PCA. So uh, the difference is that uh, uh, we are using that in there in a linear crystal. So the setup is free space and uh, a little bit more cumbersome PCA uh, is based on photoconductive effect, uh, which is not uh, uh, which is not involving a crystal, but in our case, at least a semiconductor structure, which is specifically, uh, specifically designed for our operation wavelength, which is 1.5 micron. And the advantage of that is that we can use uh, telecom technology. So at 1.5 micron, everything is fiber coupled. And that's of course an advantage for the usability of the system. Previous PCA technology was also free space, cap uh, free space coupled and it was gallium arsenide low temperature grown. Uh, 800 nanometer excitation from titanium sapphire or uh, doubling of 1.5, but uh, since a long time ago, we switched it to 1.5 micron directly because we use a telostructure of Indian gallium arsenide. So um, I will uh, stop for now replying the Q&A and um, I will take the opportunity to start describing some applications. So, um, Milan and uh, Sakski already introduced me. Uh, my name is Enrico and I'm product manager at Mellow System for the Terex product line. And uh, today I wanted to show you uh, what uh, we can uh, do with Terex time domain spectroscopy. There are different fields of applications. Uh, they are not all of them what I list here, but they are the most popular between our customers. So let's start with no destructive testing. Um, this is a, a application which is both for research and both for industrial customers. So paper, wood, polymers, pharmaceuticals, electronics, paint coatings. Why? Because terex radiation can penetrate all those materials and regarding electronics, it can penetrate packaging of electronic devices. Food analysis, uh, terex radiation is sensitive to water. Uh, there is much water absorption in the terex range. This can also be exploited at advantage of the user. For example, in the analysis of plant, seed, and other kinds of food. And looking at the water content, for example, it's a quality. So uh, spectroscopy and gas sensing, it's a very important uh, application field because it's a spectrometer. So you can detect gases, analysis spread, and other application. Material science, science is still a core notch. So semiconductor research, optical components, optoelectronic device research. And uh, last but not least, uh, in biomedical uh, um, sector, we can study tissues, people studying eyes, uh, skin, cancer cells, bacteria, viruses, and you can apply that to more complicated experiment like uh, complex experiment like pump and probe, uh, near field microscopy. So let's move to the next slide. And uh, as I said, there are a lot of materials which are suitable with uh, with, uh, to explore with terex radiation, starting from semiconductors and biomaterials, going through uh, paint, uh, uh, polymer, ceramics, paper, crystal, and glass. Uh, not suitable as, of course, metal because it's completely screening radiation. Unless we are working on reflection, we are analyzing paint and strongly absorbing you know, polar or thick material where there is a lot of scattering if the scattering center and a lot of water is of course, uh, unless it's reflection not working because of the strong absorption. So uh, I want to make an example now and show you uh, uh, spectroscopic uh, analysis of lactose. This is something we can do also with FTIR spectroscopy. For example, the advantage of terex here is that you can analyze a thick sample because terex radiation has higher penetration than mid-infrared. So we have a macroscopic lactose tablet and we just, this is alpha lactose um, and we uh, can uh, see how in real time we can compare the reference spectrum which is grayed out in the background to the absorption spectrum of the lactose with very uh, visible absorption features at, op at low terahertz range and above one terahertz and more are visible uh, if we average and we make an analysis between reference and sample. 
this kind of spectroscopy can be done also with non-macroscopic quantities. So what we are seeing here is a courtesy of a customer of us, uh, Roman Peretti from Lille University. He used the TerraSmart uh, with a standard lens setup. So it's a little bit an older generation of system. And what he did, um, he wanted to increase uh, the sensitivity. And um, let's say he wanted to see, increase the, the, uh, the quantity of uh, lactose he could detect or powered powder. So from macroscopic to microgram range. So here we are seeing a field confinement structure in the between uh, of the uh, optical setup. And there it was able to reconstruct the spectroscopy of lactose by using very extremely low quantity in comparison to the previous example. So 200 microgram of powder dispersed in less than 10 microliters of solution. Uh, just for a taste of material science uh, and optic optoelectronic devices or um, metamaterials, here a simple metamaterial filter. So Terra's radiation is microscope, is bigger in wavelength than compared to, for example, mid or optical, meaning such metamaterial structure where we pattern a material to uh, create uh, some electromagnetic effects uh, we design can be done at the microscopic scale. So you can see it with your eyes that there is a pattern on this uh, metal sheet. And when we uh, put uh, this through the beam, we can see uh, also in real time, uh, the effect of the filtering. This is just a filter that uh, then pass the low terahertz frequency with a extinction ratio of 10 to 15 dB. And so there is a peak at 2.3 terahertz, if I am not mistaken. And this is something we can design and make that easy because of the wavelength being macroscopic. So let's uh, uh, switch to the next application, a little bit more demanding metamaterial. It's a terahertz polarizer. So researcher from Cambridge University using a K15 system uh, designed uh, with the aid of uh, pa metal patterning in metamaterial embedded graphene in the gaps of these LC resonators, a tunable polarizer. Uh, here they exploit the high uh, switch uh, speed of graphene to demonstrate the modulation of the polarization at five mega speed with a rotation power of more than 20 degree. So uh, now that we see applications in material science and spectroscopy, it's time for more questions. And I, am, I invite you please to ask them in the Q&A. Okay, so there is just uh, left one on the cool silicon bolometer. Uh, which I we can just, answer in the end. Which, so which I would propose can. we continue with more applications and collect all the answers and questions in the end. Okay. So uh, now I would like to give you a taste of one of the of latest applications from, from our customers. Um, we talk about uh, CG and communication. Uh, time domain spectroscopy can be used as a tool to characterize uh, passive devices for communication and materials and schemes uh, to play with these materials to produce devices. And so uh, the group of uh, Emma McPherson in the person of Arturo Serrano uh, did uh, amazing research uh, about uh, multi-channel uh, communication, how they demonstrated uh, a multiplexer and demultiplexer device based on 3D printing technology. So this is on, on the uh, same um, idea of what we discussed before, Terrace wavelengths are microscopic compared to optical wavelengths. That means uh, we can fabricate devices which are done with, for example, 3D printing, which is a low cost method, because the wavelength is, as, is so big compared to optics that the unprecision of 3D printing is not as detrimental as for optical range. And additionally, 3D printing use polymers. Polymers are uh, penetrated by terrestrial radiation. So what uh, you are seeing here, it's a, a very nice concept in which uh, micro uh, small tubes of polymer are soldered together and uh, they are acting like small waveguides and the modes 
at the input of these structures are coupling from one step to the other one. And if uh, length, the length is coupled properly, we uh, get uh, selective uh, transmission selecting on the wavelength. So if the wavelength matches with the geometry of the device, it will be transmitted through this uh, sort of pipe uh, or stepped waveguide, otherwise not. That means now if we have a system like this, which is completely dual, so dual emitter and dual detector, we can study on one side a multiplexing uh, technique in which we couple from two emitter to different frequencies and then we detect them with uh, one single detector or the way around. So we demultiplex a broadband spectrum from our test spectrometer from one emitter and we detect that with two detectors. And this is a uh, uh, first preliminary study and uh, researchers are hoping that this could help future effort in, for example, here at uh, multiplexing and demultiplexing of information on different channels or different frequencies. Let's go now to the next one, a uh, more scientific, uh, a more um, material science topic here, antenna research, because uh, Teret's component research is of course important. Uh, Teret is relatively new technologies compared to other more established spectroscopic technologies. So research on uh, the sources and the detectors is going on as we speak. And here, the group of Professor Andrea Neto at the TU Delft in the Netherlands uses our K15 system to characterize their own uh, emitter antennas and benchmark them against uh, our uh, technology, uh, commercially available PCA antennas. How do they do that? Uh, the system is as likely more customizable than the TerraSmart or uh, because it's a scientific platform, so we can um, Keep the laser with more outputs. In this case, there is uh, pumping beams and probe beams, free space coupled at 15, 16 nanometers, and the, double, the second harmonic of this. And there is a second delay line which can be used to delay those. So, what the user can do is to uh, use our software, our electronics, and move this delay line and acquire his own telex signal with, with his own, for example, emitter as compared with our Terra K15 receiver. And they demonstrated here a milliwatt of Terra's power with their own antenna and a relatively broad spectrum. And now let's switch to an even more applied uh, area, uh, non-destructive testing. These are cables. And what we can see is that we can use in our non-destructive testing application, not only uh, features like refractive inlets, absorption, or other properties, but also, for example, the uh, property of polarization of the Tourette's radiation. So the Tourette's radiation is slightly polarized. Uh, this comes from the antenna design, and it can be polarized even more and selectively by using polarizers. And for example, here you can see uh, that uh, especially in image 2B, uh, uh, exciting uh, the cable with the different polarization reveals or not the internal wire better, depending on the alignment of the polarization with the cable. So the structure was polymer and the cable was metal. Uh, another application of polarization dependence in non destructive testing is uh, anisotropic refractive index. Uh, here triggered by uh, liquid crystal, um, polymer. So a sample here is uh, created with different orientation of this liquid crystal polymers. And by the analysis of um, the refractive index uh, value, since the sample show B refringes, it is possible with polarized terrestrial radiation to reconstruct in transmission the orientation of those liquid polymer crystal. And last but not least, uh, uh, very uh, uh, popular application on, on the latest uh, times is uh, because of its interest in the car industry. It's a non-destructive testing applied to paint layers analysis and thickness analysis. So how does it work? The most uh, easy uh, configuration is uh, the one we are showing here in the graphic. So we have a substrate which is reflective, is a metal, 
and we have some coating layers for now one. And the coating uh, layers are dielectrics and they are penetrated by terrace. So what do we do? We shine a short pulse of terrace radiation. So it's a time domain experiment. Uh, and what we do, we detect the reflected pulses at the different interfaces. Um, so this uh, coming, incoming pulses will uh, have a different position in time and we can, by resolving them, say, okay, uh, there was a delay. This is correlated to the thickness if we know the reflective index of the sample. In the real application, there will not be really uh, different pulses which are spaced to another. So there will be a more complex form which has to be deconvoluted. But the technology and the uh, research is uh, so far gone that we have very nice deconvolution algorithms which can be used to reconstruct such shapes. So tens of microns can be resolved. And if you compare that with the typical wavelength of terrets, which is more in the hundreds of microns, uh, this, uh, uh, this is expressive and it works very well I daily or with three layers or more of paint, if there is a little bit of calibration before. So it's a very promising field. And now here we have just a small demonstration video. It's our trade shot setup. Uh, let's start this video. So you will see uh, our reflection head applied to a toy, which is so the video contains audio. Please make sure to have your volume high enough. It's not a real car, but... ...for non-destructive testing and using Terra's dynamical scopy. So please follow me. And I'm going to show you the systems that we are using here. Today we are using a Terra Smart system to show you a thickness detection algorithm. I have the um, software already open here. You can see there's a difference between measuring paint on metal and also measuring flex plastics. What you need to do in order to set up your system and calibrate it, and this is what I did before, I'm using this simple metallic plate for calibration of the system. Now, aside the reflective setting, I'd just like to let you know that also transmission settings are available for metal systems for spectroscopic applications with highest resolution I uh, Terra had spent with and extremely good dynamic range. So to say up to 100 dB and six terahertz of uh, terahertz uh, spectroscopic bandwidth. So let's start with the thickness detection uh, algorithm. I'm going to use as a sample this nice VW wagon. I put it very close to the reflective sensor head. Again, we have one emitter and one detector here. Uh, terahertz optics inside. I place it very close to the uh, paint on the uh, that's on the metal layer of the car. Now it's 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 necessary to mention it is a contact-free uh, uh, solution, and it is of course harmless and can do non-destructive testing. So if you look at the monitor now, you will see a thickness of this paint on this metal layer of this BW wagon of 60 microns. Now we can do the same actually using my driver's license, which I have prepared here. I replaced the wagon sample by my driver's license. I put it very close to the front. And if we follow the monitor again, we see 900 micrometers of thickness of such a driver license. So this is a pretty straightforward way. It's a pretty precise mode of non-destructive testing. And it's only one uh, method of using a terahertz time domain spectrometer. If you want to do more, and we know from our customers, there's a very versatile application of not only Terra Smart, but also Terra K15 and Terra ASAPs. Please get in touch with us and we'll be happy to talk to you. I'm going to show you. So I hope, I hope you can hear me now and I hope you could also hear the video. That was just, as I said, a demo, um, a demonstration of how you can measure in real time thicknesses. Uh, real inline setup, of course, looks a little bit more complicated with robotic arms and all the integration you need. Uh, for that, uh, we also have uh, controlling of the system per remote uh, software interfaces. Uh, that was not now the purpose of this video, but still, uh, I think it was a little bit funny to see 
uh, something uh, made in real time. So as you saw, there are a variety of applications uh, of Tourette's radiation and Tourette's nine domain spectroscopy. Uh, we saw non distracted testing, uh, some spectroscopy application, some material science application, but there are not, of course more. So for this patient, we didn't cover really. Biomedical, we didn't say too much and we didn't speak about uh, really pump and probe in the air field. So that's not the end but I hope it was a nice overview for you. Thank you, Enrico. I'd like to conclude this talk by giving a little summary and conclusion of what has been said and what has been delivered on information to you. First of all, I'd like to recite what are the benefits of terahertz waves, so-called T waves compared to existing methods. Of course, one of the most important is it is a contactless uh, method. It is non-destructive and not harmful, and it penetrates a variety of materials. And as I mentioned to you before, the terahertz gap is no longer a gap for most of the applications. It can be accessed by photonic means, which we uh, showed you a few options in the last slides. What is the terahertz time domain spectrometer composed of? Um, it is necessary to mention the laser is a key. So whenever you look for terahertz system, Think of the laser technology that's standing in behind, and it's one of the core components of such a system. It is also the photoconductive switches, of course, and the computer or the acquisition platform being employed for your terahertz experiments. We didn't mention so far that also such a system and all our systems can be remotely accessed and easily embedded because our systems employ a cross-platform um, software interface easily accessible by any modern programming language. Apart from these points, as I said, and Enrico pointed out earlier, the applications are really wide. And you know mostly best what are the applications we deliver the instruments for you to reach your goals and your experiments. Just to mention a few of the experiments that we have seen so far, biosensing, material sciences, classic spectroscopy, near field microscopy, and as Enrico pointed out, it's not the end yet. More and more applications are coming out. And Menno Systems here, we stand ready to deliver tailored and customized solutions. All of our solutions will be fiber coupled. Uh, most of them are compact, but can be also versatile or ultra fast. Remember the also test bed that I shown to you with kilohertz scanning weight that we are working on. All our systems deliver also multi-channel uh, features to not only look at the reflective, but also on the transmitted signal at the very same time or to employ two completely separate experiment using the same laser. And also all our experiments could be dedicated to reflection settings, imaging, or simply spectroscopy. I hope you enjoyed this little presentation and we are super thankful that you stayed this time with us and we hope to hear from you uh, more. I think this is a good time to uh, discuss the upcoming questions. We still have, let me look at my watch, 10 minutes to go. So this is the time for you to uh, raise your hand, speak out, or use the Q&A function simply, and we will come to answer your questions. Maybe, Enrico, we start, I start by reading out the questions that are mostly related to our talk today. Please and, uh, start if you also can, you, with you the, answer the questions. I would so, like first to ask um, to reply the question we left from the last time, this um, uh, question from Itai. Uh, can you, if you can comment on the comparison between terrace detection with cooled, uh, cooled silicium bolometer in comparison to PCA. So basically the difference is that the bolometers are power detectors. So you don't have uh, uh, information on the phase and the timing of the pulse. So uh, usually those detectors are used, are used in the field of, for example, Fourier transform interferometry. Uh, as high sensitive power detectors, but for uh, terrace detection in a time domain spectrometer, you need a uh, uh, different scheme like electro-optic sampling or this PCA uh, scheme because you want to resolve the phase of the field and not only the power. Thank you. I go ahead with the next question from, I hope I spell correct, Rente Wups or similar. What is the spatial resolution of the Terra A subsystem? And what is the maximum length of the optical path? For example, absorption spectroscopy measurements. Okay. So thank you for the question. Uh, so spatial resolution um, is really depending on 
the kind of wavelength you are interested in. So the spectrum is broad. In case of Tera Aesops, we come up to uh, more than four, 4.5 terats we specify. And uh, so you can, uh, you can see uh, terats wavelength, three terats is 100 microns. So uh, from there, you can have an idea what is the uh, diffraction limit is both sides. Um, the maximum length of the optical path. So uh, the standard Tera Aesops adds 100 megahertz laser. So there is 10 nanoseconds of delay. So that means the full path is gonna be three meters, but in the air, but that means, uh, doesn't mean we can do different. So we have also laser, uh, we have also the possibility to customize the repetition rate. So we have already done, for example, 80 mega systems or lower There you have a little bit more of uh, time between uh, the two pulses, for example, 80 megahertz, you have 12 nanoseconds. So you have, in that case, uh, more than three meters. Two more questions, Enrico, that are referring to thickness detection and high-speed systems. One is uh, again coming from Bernard Terre. What is the speed of the paint thickness system and what is limiting it? So this relates to ultra-fast scan speeds yeah. uh, employed for thickness detection. So uh, currently, the speed of a paint thickness systems is not limited by the evaluating algorithm, really, because they have reached um, the speed of the fastest uh, system, so of the electronically uh, delay system, so like ASOPS. That means uh, uh, the limit is just the system scanning speed. In the case of ASOPS, now uh, we specify 600 Hertz, but we don't exclude in the future to be faster. And one more question in relation to comparison between terahertz and OCT in relation to thickness monitoring. For thickness monitoring, how terahertz is better than OCT? So I would- it's a little off topic, but maybe you can comment. So actually it's a very interesting question because optical coherence tomography, it's a very uh, interesting technique in, in biomedical field. For example, there are people measuring retina with this. And uh, speaking about the retina application, the, I, could, I would see that as complementary because um, for the retina application with OCT, you get thickness, but you don't know uh, really the water content and terrets can help you with that. And uh, for broader applications, um, I mean, uh, optical coherence tomography based on mid-eye and optics. So the penetration uh, is different, for example, in paint layers than terrets. So it's really depending on the application you are, you are thinking about if one of the two has advantages or not. In general, Terrets uh, is, uh, has the advantage of penetrating such dielectric layers, which with optical uh, techniques is not always the case. So there are many open questions. We'd like to answer them in time, hopefully. One question again from Deepak Kumar. He is asking for a comparison and to mention a bit the difference in relation to optical rectification used for nonlinear crystals uh -huh. and using our, let's say, semiconductor uh, detection generation. Okay, I think this is a long <laughs> discussion, uh, but a very interesting one. Okay. I would, uh, I would encourage Deepak to cont contact me per email. I think there will be an email address. Uh, the talk contact details were given in the end of this talk, Deepak. Please, so please consider to please send contact us, an email us and we, I would be very happy to discuss that. One, one question by Kun Peng in relation to metamaterial, regarding to the metamaterial studies. How does your system measure out the two orthogonal components of the terahertz polarization states X, EX and EY by rotating the emitter or detector or a different detection scheme? So now I would have to check the experiment itself, but I guess they are using polarizer to achieve that. I would have to check the reference. We can send to you the paper. And There's also an application note on our website. We have so an application note in our website. You have to yeah. recover it. It's Thank a you little bit older. For asking. So I don't remember exactly, but I think they were using polarizers. And Livio Nedelcho is asking, how much is the pulse duration in the fiber? I'd like to comment on this. This is completely dependent on your requirements, I would say. It depends on the fiber lengths that you want to employ on your 
terahertz spectrometer, the longer the fiber, the longer is the possibility of a pulse, um, a larger pulse width. But in principle, such laser systems can deliver anything between uh, 50 femtoseconds and uh, 100 femtoseconds. It also, of course, scales with the wavelengths that we employ. For terahertz, we use 15, 60 nanometer based systems. And I hope this answers your question. I can tell you that our standard is below 90 for the terahertz systems, which are not customized. And let me see if there are more answers to unanswered questions, sorry. One is again from Deepak Kumar. Using Mandel systems, can we find refractive index, conductivity, et cetera, of materials directly? So um, a refractive index, it's um, something that can be uh, uh, measured very well in transmission. And uh, there is some analysis pro software we provide to do that. And, uh, other and you get also absorption. From those, you can, of course, calculate also conductivity. There are two minutes left, so let's be really quick. Itai Epstein is asking, can you integrate low temperature measurements where sample is at cryogenic temperatures? So thank you for these questions. Yes, we can. Um, we have already worked with many people uh, making complex pump paper experiment, even in uh, coupling with uh, microscopic, uh, micros microscopes and complicated systems. And we, we have experience with that, coupling terahertz addition in cryostats. So thank you everybody for all your questions. With that, I like to conclude our uh, today's webinar. It was a pleas pleasure to be here with you. Thank you for all the uh, different questions. If you have more questions and want to talk about our solutions, please contact us under the below contact credentials. We are happy to talking to you. I say goodbye from here. Thank you. <laughs>